I'm Jessica the Museum Guide and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm telling part three of three of the story of Impressionism, focusing on the post-Impressionists, artists like Van Gogh, Gauguin, Cezanne, and Toulouse-Lautrec. Please remember to like and subscribe to my channel and let me know if you have any questions about Impressionism or museums in Paris in the comment section below. Now remember, this is part three of my series on Impressionism here at this wonderful museum. If you haven't seen parts one and two, which are linked in the description below, I highly recommend that you watch them first. Part one explains the origins of Impressionism and the works and artists who led to this massive paradigm shift in art. And part two introduces you to the most pivotal figures in Impressionism, such as Degas, Monet, Manet, Cassatt, and many more. Today, in part three, we're exploring the world of post-Impressionism. These painters were often mentored by the Impressionists, such as Pissarro and Degas, but they wanted to expand upon the style. While Impressionism was all about painting what you could actually see without additional elements, the post-Impressionists wanted to imbue their works with more emotion and subjectivity. For the post-Impressionists, sometimes there was more to the truth of a subject than meets the eye. So let's start with Paul Cézanne. Growing up, I associated still life painting with boring subjects of plain old fruit, and this painting might have bored me. However, as I get older, I now know just how hard it is to create a successful still life, and that's something Cézanne has done here. Painted between 1888 and 1890, Kitchen Table, Still Life with Basket, is an intricate composition. Every detail is carefully calculated. Look at the way that the pots, fruits, a basket, and cloth are all carefully assembled on the kitchen table. No detail has been spared. However, the table is tilted and some of the pots look unstable on the surface. Look at the grey pot and the basket. They have no more surface left on the tabletop. The table, the cupboard, and the chair all line up diagonally on the left, but they also have a distorted sense of perspective. While some accuse Cezanne of a skewed perspective, he is actually demonstrating that his main concern was geometric form and color more than representing reality in any sort of accurate way. For instance, the grey pot is presented from several viewpoints, from above and the front. He wants us to see the truth of the object even if it isn't realistic. That's why he's considered a post-impressionist painter. He isn't tied to realism. Cezanne wanted to present a more profound truth than could be presented in painting, but not in reality. He went on to paint more than 200 still lifes during the later stages of his career and told a friend, quote, The fruits love having their portraits done. They exhale their message with their scent. They reach you with all their smells and tell you about the fields they've left, the rain that made them grow, the dawns they watched. He wanted to dazzle us with the simplicity yet perfection of everyday objects. He also said, I shall astonish Paris with an apple. This painting is considered part of Cezanne's mature period, but he had been palling around with the Impressionists since their first exhi exhibition in 1874. Pizarro pushed hard for Cezanne's inclusion, even though Manet despised him and called him, quote, a mason who paints with a trowel. In fact, Cezanne was the reason that Manet declined to participate. However, Cezanne would actually sell one of the only paintings at that fateful first exhibition, yet the critics initially hated his work. I know it's hard to tell from a still life of fruit and pots, but his work was extremely controversial, especially landscape in Auvergne, and of course, a modern Olympia. A modern Olympia remixes Manet's 1863 painting, Olympia. Now remember, that painting was already controversial on its own, but Cezanne made it even more vulgar. I wouldn't put it past him. In addition to the sex worker and the servant, he also includes the male client, which is thought to be his own self-portrait. Quite spicy. As you can see, it's done in a completely different style. But by the time he begins painting fruit in the late 1880s, he was a perfectionist. Back in the 1870s, he was loose, vulgar, and messy. And by all accounts, so was his personality. Now here's a painting that will make most people smile. 
It's called Le Cirque, or The Circus, and it's by Georges Seurat. In fact, it's his final painting, done in a neo-impressionist style in 1890. However, it's not completed, and it remained unfinished when he died in 1891. This was his third work about the circus, showing us a female performer standing atop a horse at the Circus Fernando, and Seurat loved to attend. So did many other artists of the day. The same circus was painted by Renoir, Degas, and Toulouse-Lautrec. Like so many other Impressionists and Post-Impressionists, Seurat was inspired by Japanese prints, and he was specifically inspired by Charles Henry's theories on the emotional and symbolic meaning of contemporary colours. This work is an example of divisionism, as is another of his most famous paintings, Bathers at Anières, where small dots of bright colour create shapes and images. He makes use of a technique called pointillism, here tiny dots. Some people credit this as an early inspiration for cubism, but remember, it is incomplete. The white ground and grid of blue lines are still visible, so who knows what other finishing touches he may have added. It was later displayed at the 1891 Salon des Independents, and Seurat died of diphtheria just a few days later. After his death, the painting was then returned to his mother, eventually making its way here to the Musée d'Orsay. On my way to see Van Gogh and Gauguin, I'm just walking through the beautiful restaurant here at the Musée d'Orsay. If you'd like to eat a meal here, it's a good idea to make a reservation, as you can see this long queue of people. Now before I continue, let me just say a little bit about my pronunciation of this artist's name. See, depending on where you're from, people pronounce it a little bit differently. If you're from the UK, people say Van Gogh. I think in his uh, native Dutch, it's more like Van Gogh, but I'm originally Canadian, as you might be able to tell, and so I say Van Gogh, and for consistency, I'm just going to keep it that way. Van Gogh is one of the most famous painters of the 19th century, and this piece is commonly known as Starry Night Over the Rhone. At the time, Van Gogh was renting the Yellow House on the Place Lamartine, and he became obsessed with the night sky and the light in the area. Let's just start by saying that Van Gogh, though inspired by the Impressionists and their use of light and their loose brush strokes, is often considered a post-Impressionist painter. Of course, Van Gogh is now one of the most famous painters in the world, but that was not the case when he was alive. In fact, he himself was not even a painter until the age of 30, and then his career in this field was incredibly short. He died at age 37. What's incredible about Van Gogh's life is that until he turned to painting, he failed at almost everything else he tried. He failed at teaching, preaching, as an art salesman, and of course, he failed at love, with a number of tragic love affairs. Van Gogh moved to Arles in the south of France in 1888, and he was incredibly inspired by the vivid colours of the countryside. He hoped to start an artist commune, but his brother Theo, an art dealer, could only convince Paul Gauguin to come and stay with Vincent. The two men then had an intense friendship and lived together for 63 days. Of course, this is also the time period when Van Gogh's mental health suffered, which I'll explain more about in a few moments. Now, Vincent's brother Theo was an art dealer and his biggest supporter, and he arranged for this painting to be shown at the Société des Artistes Indépendants in 1889, along with Van Gogh's irises. He was well received at the exhibition, but of course, he did not become famous or highly regarded until after his death. Like Monet, Van Gogh was obsessed with colour, and the new artificial lighting was fascinating to him. In this painting, he captures the reflections of the town's gas lighting as it hits the dark night water of the Rhone River. You can also see two lovers strolling by the banks of the river in the foreground of the painting. However, even as he created wonderful works like this one, his mental health was deteriorating. This was where the fateful event occurred when Van Gogh cut off his own ear on December 23, 1888. The events are fuzzy, but here is what we think might have happened. Gauguin and Van Gogh had a massive fight, which may have been about a model they both used who liked Gauguin. Van Gogh was jealous. During the course of the argument, Van Gogh severed much of his left ear and took the bloody mess to a woman called Rachel at a local brothel. He then returned home and passed out. The next day, the authorities were called and they thought Van Gogh was dead. 
They arrested Gauguin, who was soon released when they realized what had happened. Gauguin left Arles in disgust, and the two men never saw each other again. I mean, it really is a sordid tale. Theo was beside himself, as he would be, and he helped Vincent check into a local hospital. However, Vincent soon left Arles and spent one year in a mental hospital in saint rémy de provence So here is our second piece by the famous Dutch post-impressionist. This is a self-portrait, which he painted in oil on canvas in 1889. This could be Van Gogh's final self-portrait of the 32 he produced over a 10-year period. We've seen a lot of artist models today, but Van Gogh usually lacked the money to pay for them, so he often used himself. Most art historians think he painted this work just before he left the mental asylum at saint rémy de provence and brought it with him to auvers sur oise near Paris. At this time, he was seeing Dr. Paul Gachet, who described the painting as absolutely fanatical. You can compare this one, which is quite somber and subdued, to the works he created in Arles, which are exuberant and sunny. You can also see the difference here between the other self-portraits he painted. Van Gogh himself could certainly see the difference. He sent the picture to Theo and wrote, You will need to study the picture for a time. I hope you will notice that my facial expressions have become much calmer, although my eyes have the same insecure look as before, or so it appears to me. Art historians point to the almost trembling quality of the painting to show us Van Gogh's state of mind. Less than five months later, he is believed to have taken his own life by shooting himself in the chest while painting wheat fields. However, there is another theory, that two boys shot him by accident, and he pretended to have shot himself so they would not get in trouble. Regardless, he died two days later and was buried in auvers sur oise This is one of the busiest rooms in the Musée d'Orsay. You can see loads of people pressing in, trying to get their photos, and yes, even their selfies, with this, one of the most famous painters of the 19th century, and maybe even of all time. Let me preface this section on Paul Gauguin by saying that Gauguin was not a good dude. In fact, he was a pretty bad dude. In his own words, he was a, quote, infidel, a monster, a savage, a wolf in the woods without a collar. He fled Europe for a, quote, more exotic and primitive life where he could be free of money and also free of his wife and children. When he arrived in Tahiti when he was 43, Gauguin preyed on young Polynesian girls and had sexual relationship with girls as young as 12 and 13. He likely died of syphilis 11 years later, but not before spreading it to many women and girls, including his so-called, quote, native wife, a child of 13 called Taha Amana. Years later, when Gauguin returned to this area, Taha Amana refused to see him again, and there is speculation that their relationship was non-consensual. Gauguin never divorced his wife Meta, and he sent her his paintings from Polynesia so he could arrange sales and exhibitions. This painting, titled Ara Area, was displayed at his 1893 exhibition. The painting was not received well by critics, and the red dog was heavily mocked. However, it was one of Gauguin's favorite paintings, and he bought it back in 1895, before he left Gauguin for good. Now let's leave Gauguin for good. I mean, can you tell I'm not a fan? Now, let's make our way to the final room of our tour. We are going to be talking about a quintessentially Parisian painter, Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec. He was known for his debauched lifestyle and storied personal life, almost as much as he is known for his art. He painted nightlife, calling his scenes, quote, nocturnal paradises. He was also known to drink a mix of 50% cognac and 50% absinthe that he called the earthquake. I'm good. I don't want to try that. He even hollowed out his walking stick so he'd have a steady supply. Toulouse-Lautrec needed to use a walking stick because he had a congenital defect in his legs, which never grew beyond those of a child. His parents, wealthy aristocrats, were first cousins, which could explain his disability. Though he romanticized the life of the impoverished artist, he also sold many of his pieces as advertisements and posters. Though this made him a bit of a sellout, he was able to earn a good living and enjoy the best things in life. For Toulouse-Lautrec, that was going out to the Moulin Rouge and other establishments in Bohemian Montmartre. 
By the way, if his name sounds familiar to you, it may be because he was portrayed by John Leguizamo in Baz Luhrmann's 2001 film Moulin Rouge. In this painting, the star of the show is infamous dancer known for her frenetic can-can, Louise Weber, or La Golou, the glutton, because of her love of the drink. She's with her partner, No Bones Valentine. Even in a crowd scene like this one, everyone is highly individualized, and look, we can even see Toulouse-Lautrec himself. And the work of Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec is a perfect place for us to end our series on the Musée d'Orsay. Well, that's it. This is the end of our series on the Musée d'Orsay and Impressionism. I've really enjoyed walking through these paintings and this history with you, and I've learned a lot. I can't wait to take you through more museums in Europe. Let me know which ones in the comments you're most interested in seeing. And I'll see you the next time I'm in the museum.